Welcome back everyone. This is the State of the Nation. Now, I want to take you to Zambia. Zambia is a landlocked country in the continent of Africa. Their population is around 20 million. Their economy is about $76 billion. Zambia too has economic problems. And they too defaulted and then were forced to go to the IMF back in 2022. Now, in August of last year, Zambia got the nod from the IMF for a $1.3 billion fund facility bailout, of which the first tranche of $185 million was disbursed. Now, for argument's sake, let's say it was the easy part. One of the conditionalities of the IMF agreement with Zambia, uh, well, not even in Zambia, even here in Sri Lanka too, uh, is the Zambian government must immediately start talks with its creditors to write off some parts of the loan. This is where the program is designed to fail because no creditor who bought bonds to make a buck wants to lose what is due to them. Let's get more uh, context uh, to Zambia's story with the IMF and for that joining me now is the Director of Research at the Institute of Race, Power and Political Economy at the New School in New York, USA, Dr. Grieve Chelba. He joins me via, uh, via Zoom from Lusaka, Zambia. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. I appreciate you giving your time uh, to speak to us here. Now, you have been very critical of Zambia's uh, arrangement with the IMF. Why do you have such an opinion on the matter and what is the actual situation in Zambia that we don't hear about from the mainstream Western media? Uh, Mahesh, thank you so much for having me on your program. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm very critical of the IMF program is precisely because uh, it requires crushing austerity, uh, and that austerity is to be carried by, a poor, by the poor. Essentially, austerity means that expenditures on pro-poor uh, sort of kind of initiatives that are advantages to the poor, social services, health, education, agriculture, subsidies to fuel, uh, both to energy, both fuel and electricity, those are going to be removed. At the same time, the IMF program requires that taxes be raised, but those taxes will largely be imposed on the poor. Uh, and this is the reason, Mahesh, why I'm very critical of the IMF program precisely because the burden of restructuring is going to be carried by the poor, right? On, on the other hand, uh, what, we don't, what you don't get to hear about Zambia on the Western news is that uh, Zambia's debt problems are largely blamed on uh, of China uh, and not so much on Western banks, Western hedge funds, uh, and so on and so forth. But the truth is much more complex. The truth is much more complex, Mahesh, and essentially, there's enough blame to go around, right? It's not one single entity that's to blame for Zambia's debt problem. It's many entities across the globe, uh, many elites in Zambia to blame for Zambia's problem. But I think the Western uh, narrative around Zambia's debt problem is a narrative that blames one entity, right? And it's a narrative that requires that the only way to get ourselves out of this debt problem is to impose crushing austerity on the poor. I mean, listening to you, doctor, it's like deja vu for us here in Sri Lanka because apparently it's the same thing that the IMF is proposing to us as well. It's just cut and paste. This is what we've been telling for a longer period of time. Now, doctor, like in Sri Lanka, many people, politicians and uh, think tanks in Zambia would have pitched that the IMF as the only solution. What should have been Zambia's approach alternative to the IMF? Um, certainly... You know, we have to understand that at the, at the core, we have what, what is called a balance of payments crisis or a debt problem, right? So we had a debt problem. So the problem is that we had a lot of debt that was falling due shortly and, uh, and we need to do something about it, right? So traditionally, what has happened is that uh, countries that have a debt problem have gone to the IMF uh, to get some assistance. And essentially, what ha has happened traditionally is that the IMF was the biggest creditor. Traditionally, the IMF or the World Bank were the biggest creditors to many of uh, many countries in the global south. But in the 21st century, that scenario has changed, right? So we have a multitude of creditors, China, private banks, hedge funds, uh, multilateral entities, bilateral entities, and so on and so forth. So given this complexity in terms of sources of credit, it is quite, uh, uh, in, in a way, naive to only engage with one entity, which is the IMF, right? To try to resolve one's debt. So my suggested approach in the Zambian case was that we should have 
figured out a way on our own of engaging with this multitude of creditors, right, on a case-by-case basis, because each one of them has got different interests, different motivations, and so on and so forth. And it's quite clear in the Zambian case that by going through the IMF route, we have now gotten ourselves in a stalemate, right? I I think, um, Mahesh, if you've been following the discussions around Zambia's uh, debt situation is that we're caught up in a stalemate because we went with the IMF route, which then set in motion something that is called the G20 Common Framework, which is supposed to be the framework that's supposed to allow us to resolve our debt. But this framework is very constricting because, again, it presumes that there's only a single creditor with a single motivation. But as we know, we have many, many creditors by age with different complexities. And uh, so this would have been my preferred way of resolving Zambia's debt to engage our creditors on a case-by-case basis. Absolutely, indeed. Uh, I wish I had more time, but uh, we're running out of time. Uh, thank you. That was the Director of Research and the Institute of Race, Power and Political Economy at the New School in New York, USA, Dr. Grieb Shelba, speaking to us uh, from Lusaka in Zambia. A short break now. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment.